Angela. It was Leslie's first day yesterday. I know. Oh, no, this 
Thank you, Jesus. You are so amazing. So amazing. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? So we want to pray and thank Carlsberg Marston Brewery. They've sent us a huge amount of 
Foxes and crisps, nuts and juices and fruit juices and all sorts of things. It's been amazing. And we had to pile a lot upstairs as well. And also Blackburn Rovers this week as uh, Sid, our advert with some more food. They sent us food from Blackburn Rovers, so we thank Blackburn Rovers as well. And a lot of other people that have seen our adverts have sent us food in, so we want to say a big thank you. So let's just pray, Lord. We thank you that you are a God who listens to our prayers. We thank you, Lord, that Dan, in our food bank, who doesn't yet come to our church, has been praying for weeks for more crisps. And Lord, didn't you answer his prayer abundantly? This is a faith thing for him. This is his first prayer with us. And he has seen boxes up to the ceiling of crisps. And we thank you, Lord, that you've answered this prayer, which is going to be such an encouragement to him in his first venture, praying for things. Mm. And so we thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us from this brewery, Lord, that they have indeed heard our prayers and that you've sent us so much, so much. We thank you as well for Blackburn Rovers, Lord, who seeks as well to help out uh, different organisations like ourselves, we're feeding families. And so we thank you for their generosity. Can't thank them enough. And Lord, we thank you for many people who have looked at our notice on Facebook and those that regularly, Lord, come and bring us food. We just thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have so answered our prayers in abundance. And the way you do that, Lord, is that you speak to other people's hearts and minds. Whether they know you or not, sometimes you speak to their hearts and minds. And we thank you for that. And we just want to pray for Leslie, Lord. She's had her birthday yesterday, which we'll sing in a minute. We thank you for her. And uh, we, we pray that she'll have had an amazing time when it's her birthday yesterday. And I know we were able to pop some flowers to her because. Again, we were given an abundance of daffodils yesterday, left from uh, some, one of our supermarkets, and we thank them for that. It's really, really amazing that they've been able to do that. We had a young couple come in at the end and brought some food, and were very moved by what we're doing here. And then stopped before they left, leaving us some money. And we know they're belonging to Jed and Jackie that come and help us, and we thank you for them as well.
you know, long time coming. We want churches to work together more in our community here. We are doing that. We, we gather together for long life with this Friday. And we thank you for that, all the members. And we pray for Sue Austin, oh Lord, on Wednesday. She's going in to have a cataract operation. So we just pray, Lord, that you would calm the nerves, that you would give her your peace. And we know on this mum like that, it's, it's a brilliant operation and you can be there. And so we just pray for Sue, Lord, that you're with her and her family. And uh, we'll be thinking about her at that time. Mm -hmm. And we know that you guide surgeons' hands. Uh, and that, Lord Jesus, that would just be such a benefit. We thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to sing now one more song before Hamlet comes and shares with me. And, oh sorry, yes, we are going to sing for Leslie now. We'll do, we'll do it now and sing again. <laughs>
Learn to love with God. We love him here. I surrender everything to you, Jesus. Everything that I am. Everything that we all are here. We give you all everything, Jesus. And we pray that you prepare our hearts and minds right now. As we pray for others to come and give us your word. A word that uh, is from his heart. And we pray, Lord, you give us listening ears, listening hearts, but also hands of action that we will actually put this, whatever we hear, into action. Because words are not any good unless they are put into action. So we pray you give us that mindset today in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, and I... To me in 2017 was a, really a bit of a shock that the whole when Jesus said, Look, we're not, we're not, you, you're not outwardly focused, church and outwardly focused. It, it, it came as a bit of a shock, really. Um, and, and, and yes, of course, I, they said to us, I mean, so yes, we, we want you to gain members and we, we want your church to grow, but it, everything was focused on um, basically the, the church things, church people, church stuff happening in the church building. Um, and, and that's why we used to make maintenance. We were, we were trained to maintain, uh, really. Whereas I'm beginning to understand now, um, uh, I think this is a change that's coming to my thinking, which I believe is of the Lord, that, that like, what Jesus has let loose, we'll see, is, is, is more of a movement, actually. It's a, it, it's a spirit movement. So in the passage from starting with Acts 10, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to read uh, from uh, from verse 23. So what's happened before this is uh, Peter, who's been, the, as it were, the Holy Spirit's human leader um, of the church in Jerusalem, has, has ended up in a place called Joppa. And, and there in Joppa, what happens to him is he has this incredible uh, vision from God. Um, and then... Um, a group of uh, people come from a chap called Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion. So Peter's about, God is about to cross a big barrier with Peter. I mean, it's not just, you know, it, 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 it going to the Gentiles, but to a Roman Gentile. So, <clears throat> uh, the Holy Spirit has prepared Peter, and then it, it, it says that, it, so, the next morning, Acts 10, 23, the next morning, Peter got up and went along with the men, and some of his friends from Joppa went along. A day later, they entered Caesarea, and Cornelius, who was expecting them, had his relatives and close friends waiting with him. The very minute Peter came through the door, Cornelius was up on his feet, greeting him. 
then down on his feet as though he would worship him. And Peter pulled him up and said, no, no, none of that. I, I'm a man and only a man. I, I'm no different from you. As they were talking things over, they went on into the house where Cornelius introduced Peter to everyone who had come. Peter addressed them. You know, I'm sure this is highly irregular because Jewish people just don't do this, visit and relax with people from another race. But God has begun to show me no race is better than any other. So the minute I was sent for, I came. But now I would like to know why you sent for me. Well, then Cornelius begins to explain that four days ago, he experienced the vision of an angel who said to him, Cornelius, your daily prayers and your neighborly acts have brought you to God's attention. I said, that's brilliant, that, isn't it? Father, all these wonderful people who have been asked, let, let their neighborly acts come to your attention, Lord. And, uh, I, and, and the angel said, I want you to send a job, but get Simon, the one called Peter, who was stayed by Simon the Tanner down by the sea. Well, I did it and I sent for you, and you've been good enough to come. Now, we're all here in God's presence, ready to listen to whatever the Master has put in your heart to say to us. Well, Peter fairly exploded then with his good news. It's God's own truth that nothing could be plainer that God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as he says, the door is open. The message he sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put back together again. Well, he's doing it everywhere, among everyone. And you know the story of what happened in Judea. It began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth. He was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit. And he was ready for action. He went through the country helping people, healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. And he was able to do all this because God was with him. Well then, Peter explains that he had been a witness and so had the others uh, of the twelve and, and others. A witness for everything Jesus did, but they killed him and hung him from a cross, he says. But in three days, got him up and alive and out where he could be seen. Now, of course, not everyone saw him. He wasn't put on public display. <clears throat> Witnesses had been carefully handpicked by God beforehand. Us. Us who were the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce he is in fact the one God destined as the judge of the living and the dead. Oh, we are not alone in this. <clears throat> Our witness is that Jesus is the means to the forgiveness of sins and it's backed up by the writings of all the prophets. Well, no sooner than the words come out of Peter's mouth, the Holy Spirit just fell on all the listeners. The believing Jews who came with Peter couldn't believe it couldn't believe the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on all outsiders or non-Jews. There it was, they heard them speaking in tongues and heard them praising God. Then Peter said, do I hear any objections to baptizing these our friends with water? For they received the Holy Spirit exactly like we did. Hearing no objections, he ordered they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Well, then later in the story, Paul, who we heard about last week, goes off to a place called Ephesus. And when Paul arrived in Ephesus, he found a group of disciples there. Well, one of the first things he said to them was, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? This is Acts 19. Did you take God into your mind only, or did you also embrace him with your heart? Did God get wine inside you? Well, we've never heard of that, they said. A Holy Spirit, God living within us. How were you baptized then? Asked Paul. Oh, we were baptized with John's baptism, they said. Ah, oh, ah, oh, that explains it, Paul said. 
For John preached a baptism of radical life change so people would be ready to receive the one coming after him. Now that turned out, of course, to be Jesus. And if you've been baptized in John's baptism, you're now ready for the real thing, to receive Jesus, and they were. As soon as they heard of it, they were baptized in the name of the Master Jesus. Paul put his hands on their heads and the Holy Spirit entered them. From that moment on, they were praising God in tongues and talking about God's actions. Altogether, about 12 people were there that day. Well, then Paul began to do his usual work in and, and through the synagogue, <clears throat> and which caused a dispute, which caused Paul then to leave and start to form a, a little group of disciples. So then, just quickly now, down at 11 and 12. God did quite powerful things through Paul. Really, things quite out of the ordinary. And word got around and people started taking pieces of clothing, handkerchiefs, scarves and the like, that had touched Paul's skin and then touched the sick with them. And amazingly, the touch did it. They were healed and whole. Well, I just thank you for your word, Father. And uh, I just come this morning. Now then, <clears throat> uh, I want to introduce you to this uh, to this lovely chap here up on my PowerPoint. What you can see him. This is this is the very excellent Mark T. Yamas. Uh, and as you can see from the notes there, Mark is the founding pastor of a church called Mosaic in Central Arkansas. I think they pronounce it. That's right. Yeah. In America, a multi-ethnic economically diverse church, black and white Americans, men and women from over 30 nations walking and working together and worshiping God. So what are you introducing us to Mark for? Well, I'm, I'm introducing Mark today because um, <clears throat> I've just been reading this little book here called Kingdom Come by a chap called Reggie McNeil, and he comments on Mark and his congregation who are in this place called Little Rock in Arkansas. Um, and he writes about the, the impact God is helping Mark and his church to have. They consider the zip code, I think American zip code is what we call our postcode area. Yeah. So they consider their postcode area in downtown Little Rock, which is the highest crime rate in the city as they ambition field. The congregation provides food, how about this, to 52% of the poor sports population, that's 80,500 people each month. More than 300 people are receiving free immigration legal service. These figures go back to about 2013-14. Uh, 20 young people who have uh, now grown out of the state's foster care system are being housed and mentored in four homes located on the church property that in conjunction with the organization Habitat for Humanity, the congregation's renovating six trailers to house more than 40 women who have been rescued from drugs and prostitution. Since the church was established in 2001, within a one mile radius of the church, crime has dropped by 10%. <clears throat> and then they were saying that in 2013, uh, the church, through its volunteer service program, uh, made an impact in the community of, of if you counted it up in money terms, it would be $350,000. By almost 900 people, here's the interesting thing, that's twice the number of people who are attending Sunday services. And, and because the church has a large area of, of um, <clears throat> land and property, uh, they're also uh, creating jobs uh, by, by opening up um, some business and, and retail space and, and, and other spaces around them there. And he said, well, what do you, you bring in us? You see, that's what happens when your church becomes a movement, not a maintenance. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit gets your church back into the book of Acts. Now, now I'm sure that while there was a lot of social impact talking about Mark's church, 
I, I, I know from bits of research that people are joining it and becoming Christians too. Do you, do you know what I mean? You see, that this is, this is, and I really do believe these days, this is what God is saying to us. Future church is going to be about Holy Spirit movement. It's not going to be about maintenance. doesn't mean we're not going to love our building or look after it. I don't mean it like that. But, but we want to have this movement of God amongst us and impact our community. Now, where does this, where does this movement Christianity begin? And actually, if you read out your Bible carefully, it begins with God himself. It begins with the Trinity. We, we know that the Bible witnesses to God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a kind of interdependent fellowship of three co-equal persons who, who all keep their essential natures in perfect love and agreement and constantly express deep, active intimacy. It, it's like a personal, loving community. God is like a personal, loving community. To use our word, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, to use a modern phrase, are there for each other. You get it? Now you see how that spills over. When a church is connected as Paul and Peter's two groups were well, with that God, through that spirit, you notice how that movement begins to come out. They are there for each other in a holy wholeness that we can't grasp. Now in this holy wholeness, God is publicly outgoing. He's publicly outgoing. Let me explain what I mean. God's not sat, you know, to use our kind of terms of God. God's not sat up there in heaven maintaining himself. Ooh, I, I don't feel so good today. I, I better have a look up. He's not che che checking his temperature, you know. His whole focus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are not focused on themselves. They're focused on, they're focused on us, on people of the world on putting things, as Peter said in his earth, putting everything back together that's broken and damaged. <clears throat> and in this being publicly outgoing, that's how God shows his glory and, and his worth. Now you see our Bible puts it like this in the most famous verse of many of us know, John 3.16, the Father so loves us, he gives the Son. You see that nothing spoils their outgoing love and respect, their interaction. I can imagine the kind of chance they are. My beloved son, when you and the Spirit join me in my work, it delights me. And the Son and the Holy Spirit go, Father, you, you are plans are so wonderfully created, you know, brilliant. It's a perfect family and community of outgoing divine love. You see, the Father and the Son, Jesus says, then pour out the Holy Spirit, give the Holy Spirit, who to? To bless the people of God. So we can see that in Acts, particularly, but throughout all of the New Testament, the second half of the Bible, the Father loves and cares for the Son and the Spirit. The Son loves and obeys the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit witnesses the love of the Father and the Son, they're all working together in a continual, common, outgoing self-sacrifice. Now here's a parable from yesterday. I don't know if any of you know that my team, Wales, managed to snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. <laughs> and you know why? Poor game management. Shame you don't find out with God. But you notice that the the, the Trinity's gear management's fantastic. They know what they're doing. They're implementing this tremendous plan to, to bring back everything in creation, to bring people back into this tremendous relationship. And they're continually working, game managing, in, in this outgoing self-sacrifice to rescue us. See, God doesn't rescue us because he's lonely. I've heard people say nothing. They say, oh, you know, God was telling me lonely, isn't he? He didn't feel lonely at all. He's got the Son and the Holy Spirit. Don't feel lonely. Don't rescue us 
I'll tell you why he rescues us. He <coughs> rescues us because it's the nature of love to pour itself out on others. He's made a commitment to restore the lost, the wholeness, and, and to heal brokenness. God rescues us because he's a rescuer. He loves us, the Bible says. He loves us because he is love. <clears throat> That's great. Now, when we, when we in connection with our God, See, I read that stuff about Mark's church. He did, uh, uh, oh, are they bigger than I said, yeah, I know they are. But it excited me. Do, do you know we, we want the Holy Spirit to fall on us and become a church of that? Yes. yes. Oh, imagine stuff like this happening. In, imagine, imagine God pouring out such love upon us and, and, and such healing and rescue and healing from brokenness and all kinds of stuff happening. The, the, the people are taking hankies that have touched us and laying them on the sick relatives and the sick relatives are getting better. You see, well, you're going a bit over the top there. Well, it was happening with Paul. This is what happens when church becomes a movement, not a maintenance. You see? So movement Christianity starts with God. He used to say, applied movement Christianity then stems from the incarnation of Jesus, the fact that God himself has stepped into human history in Jesus. <clears throat> Jesus comes in obedience to his Father. The Bible tells us he himself is baptized with the Spirit, and then amazing things begin to happen. Here's one of the most amazing for me, that Jesus has this missional ministry. He doesn't write a book. He, he doesn't run for office. He doesn't start an org. He lets loose an organic, worldwide, missional movement. And you notice how Jesus constantly aims to move from addition to reproduction. Now I've touched on this a number of times, so I'll say it very quickly. I believe that in the mission of ministry Jesus had in Galilee, there would be followers in village communities who would be living visible, viable, verbally attractive, different lives. That's what was happening in Ephesus. Did you notice with that bit we read about Paul? The Holy Spirit fell on that little group of disciples and the next thing, all kinds of stuff's happening. And the church, the church is growing. Why? Because they're living visible and viable and verbal, attractively different lives. Why is that? Because, listen friends, the people of God are like every living organism on the planet. We have to reproduce to survive. We have to reproduce to survive. You see, the plain blunt truth of the matter is that as human beings, you know, just take us as a human race, we are actually always just about one generation from extinction. Okay? So, in, in, in other words, you, you know, if, 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 if young couples don't have children, you know, we're not going to survive. You know, we're not going to survive. That's just basic life. I said, well, what's the point of that, Brother Ron? Well, the point of that is we can see in Acts that this is, a, this is the movement, Jesus' movement, Christianity is a number of characteristics. You notice how Peter had it and Paul had it and the groups had it. The first thing you notice is they have a living and active faith. That living and active faith in Jesus. They've had a direct, transforming God encounter. We read about Cornelius and his family and friends. Remember, that, remember to the people of his, you might say, oh yeah, oh, that's a good story. Yeah, but to the people of his day, that, that was a massive barrier to cross. This guy was from the Roman Empire. He had taken over their country. You, you, you know, this was big stuff. They didn't believe people like that could come to God. 
And they done a direct transforming God encounter. So the group Paul met in Ephesus. Suddenly there comes to be a new stress on the Holy Spirit and his work, a thirst and dynamic for renewal. Now that leads to that leads to attention. Now you wouldn't think it would, but it led to attention. The, the next thing that happened when Peter had been to this group is that the church in Jerusalem said, and what the heck do you think you were doing? Going to the Gentiles. Well, Peter had to explain about his vision and everything. You see, because it brings attention between the context and the culture. You see, Peter and Paul came out of Second Temple Judaism. Now, I don't mean this unkindly. This is a historical fact. Their initial reaction, they knew that there were things in the Old Testament about God calling Gentiles, but they tended to think in a maintenance mode. Oh, well, God is going to sort us out first. That's what we think, isn't it? See? We can get into it. But when God started crossing frontiers, this calls for adaptable thinking and application. Living and active faith, a prayer that is more than habit and discipline. You notice how they start to fervently ask God to establish his priorities. There's a deep conviction. They're praying, God, change us first. They, they have a regular rhythm of repentance and renewal. They're constantly saying to God, come on, God, turn us from our selfishness. Turn us toward you. And that shows in, in, in this faith, and a personal and corporate energy that pushes frontiers in the community, in and outside. I can notice when God is working like this, you can't stay the same and you can't stay safe. See, you can't stay the same and you can't stay safe. So we see that there's this living faith. We see that there was this, this really in, we see this really praying and then we see that there was intentional multiplying you notice what's happening as the movement as you see the holy spirit you can't contain him in a building and peter and paul become outwardly focused not inwardly focused you see it all the way through the big book of Acts. this is what we mean when we talk about a kingdom outlook you notice how they raised up others' ministry. They weren't self-seeking. They weren't being defensive. They weren't building and protecting their own personal kingdoms. They were going exponential. They were intentionally following the Holy Spirit's lead. Now I have to say that one of the big, one of the things that emerges is that there's big sacrifices going on here. Sacrificial, big sacrificial living. Big commitment to a cause bigger than themselves. You notice how, how when Peter goes to Cornelius, he has to say, look, I wouldn't normally do this. I, 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 as, as a Jewish person, even though Jesus loves me and I love him, I wouldn't normally mix with non-Jews like this. Right? So he, the Holy Spirit got him to push a barrier, you see, because the cause and the commitment was bigger. And Peter's view. Now, of course, if we want to have a church like Mark's church over there in the States, and, you know, that change is not going to come without us being prepared to give something up. You see, you notice that the Holy Spirit, remember these are the initial apostles of the church here, even they are having experiences and application that are affecting their existing comfort and convenience and security. Listen, I want to be honest about myself for a minute here. I have a sport that, you know, as a little boy going through Sunday school, and that's my background, all that, you know, kind of church stuff. Oh, wasn't it marvellous that St. Paul went out? Oh, and he went all over. Paul would have thought it was marvellous. 
when he gives his testimony, the three times he gives it, he says, I was a Pharisee. Hey, this guy was the orthodox of the orthodox. If he fell down the stairs in the morning, he thought God was predestined. I'm being serious. If a gentle shadow fell on him in the marketplace, Paul would go home and bath. And he wouldn't come out for a day. So that he was clean in the eyes of the Torah. You imagine what a big change that was to go to people. Totally, taught, you know, to live among them, to eat among them, to work among them. You know, we think, oh, it's not great, is it? Fuck me, that would be like me being translated, transplanted in China tomorrow. You've got to learn a new language. <clears throat> you know, you've got to learn different customs. But you notice what happens. The Holy Spirit produces this, this constant but gentle firm pressure. He moves these believers into active body change. See? Listen, I, I'm not much of one of these people for working out, but apparently, apparently, we, we grow muscle through tension. And you notice how the apostles were doing it? This is one of the other characteristics. There was a reproducibility. They didn't have a big budget. They didn't have massive plans. They didn't have huge structures. What they did have were these accessible, reproducible ideas that worked at every level. So where do you get that from? Well, if you read in, as we have, Acts 2, 42, it says they were devoted to the apostles, teaching the prayers and the fellowship, the breaking of bread, you know, taking the communion together, looking out for one another. Hey, you can put God down anywhere. It's so accessible. It's so accessible, the average person can understand and share in the vision. You don't need any special knowledge and training to do that. And these simple reproducible ideas, this is not a good quote now, is it? Began to spread virally through their contagious relationships. Hey, something big is happening when people are taking hand keys that you touch to go and lay them on their sick relatives. You see? They were building, they, were, they had existed, but they were also, the Holy Spirit was building new social networks. Their concern was to be a countercultural community that was attractively different from their local situation. Now you notice, they had, a, they had a belief integrity. They had a belief integrity. Well, what do I mean by a belief integrity? You, 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 you know? They had a firm, passionate conviction that the Bible, the Old Testament, it would have been there, was God's word. You notice that what was happening was rooted in more than just kind of temporary, charismatic leaders or visionaries. And why does God lay this emphasis on, on that they traveled and they taught the Bible? Well, because if, if, if people get those ideas, those, those basic ideas, anybody can retell those. You don't need, you know, if something happened to Paul, the movement goes on. In fact, we know that something happened to both Peter and Paul, they were executed. But it didn't stop Christianity from going. Why? Because the ideas were already out there. Belief in God's word was already out there. <clears throat> you see? And the organic church's belief is passionate and it's personal and it's robust. You see, I, I grew up in I grew up in a kind of afternoon. Now you need to be careful, brother Ron. You know, you don't want to be putting people off. Hey, it's a joke. Nobody's following a bland belief system. People follow what's passionate. That's the bottom line. 
And then I notice they, they have this incarnational ministry. Now what do I mean by an incarnational ministry? In Acts, the Christian movement knows the gospel, the good news of Jesus is unchanging. But if you plant it into a different culture, the expression and the result will vary. Let me say that again. The gospel is unchanging, but if you plant it into different cultures, expression and result will vary by the culture. We are the people of God and we are sent. We are called to appropriately identify with the people to whom we are sent. We have to learn to translate our unchanging gospel truth into the changing local language of our people and our values. Now, if you know a little bit about the New Testament, you find a surprising thing. When you read about Jesus in the four biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find Jesus talks about the kingdom of God a lot. When you read Paul, he talks about Jesus as Lord a lot. Why? Because when you get out into a Greek culture, kingdom of God is a Jewish idea. What Paul said about Jesus as Lord, if you translate it back, is exactly what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. See, by Lord, Paul didn't mean Jesus was a nice aristocrat. He meant he was the Lord of all creation, the one who made everything. But you notice how they're speaking and acting the Jesus gospel in ways that directly address and affect the places they live and work and play. And that's what we're going to do. That's what God wants us to do. So that we and they understand both the gospel and the local culture. So we are, we are faithful to Jesus' word. But we're also culturally relevant and countercultural. But why is that? So that the Jesus faith connection starts to touch ordinary people everywhere in daily life. But behind it is this extraordinary vision of Jesus shaped world. See how they're doing it? You notice that they believed in, in people of God empowerment. They're all of Jesus' followers who God called. They're all spirit equipped. They're all given freedom to take up lead and responsibility. Nobody is disempowered. Future Church will develop non-traditional leadership and church styles. Everyone, everywhere, everyday ministry. Sharing and affirming them. Now why is that? Because if we keep disempowering and disillusioning people, instead of developing the people we can see are emerging leaders, they're going to go elsewhere to exercise the gifts and the calling. Now what Acts shows is the complete opposite. They show a rapid mobilization of all the people, effective, organic, adaptive leadership. We've seen it all through the stories. And as future church, as future church, we will need to big-heartedly appreciate other people's models. Now why is that? Well, if Peter was called in by the church, who said, what, what do you think you're going? Talking to Jesus to a Roman centurion and he did with all them Gentiles. Listen, movement Christianity is messy. <laughs> it really is messy. Arts is messy. And if you want a nice, you know, Christian life, it goes A, B, C, D. Don't get into it. Don't waste your brilliant time. People make mistakes, they overstress certain things. They believe some things that are different to what we believe. They're all Christians but we have slightly different emphasis. But here's the thing, the widest nets gather the more fish. That's why we are learning, it's taken a while, it's taken longer than we wanted it to, but we're starting to learn to work with other fellowships 
in other projects, even if they think slightly differently and they, they, they worship slightly differently. You see, you can't contain a God movement in a single style and outlook. Here's, here's a shocking thing, it's taken me and Angela a long time to learn. None of us has it completely sorted out when it comes to God. Do you know why? Because he's just a bit bigger than we are. Let's, let's, let's not be less than open. Yes, let's hold our convictions, but let's rejoice for and speak well of the others that God is blessing. Even if we differ on some little things. Now let's be blunt about this as we come into an end here. We're a small community, and if we're not careful in small communities, because it was true about us sometimes in South Wales, we got very small minded. Let me give you an example. Angela and I grew up in a Methodist church culture. We used to tell jokes about the Welsh Baptists that they lived behind a wall in heaven because they thought they were the only ones that not kind of stuff allowed to go. See? Let's not stifle what God wants to do because of small mindedness. No, oh, when they read up to the prayer book, but what is the land? Go on. Honey. Thank God they're reading prayers up to somewhere. Mm. You know what I mean? When God starts acting, we've got to let him move. We've got to let the growth come. We've got to take on the leaders and structures, the structures that God gives us, and we've got to do it rapidly. We may have to totally change some of our methods and not stifle the action. Do you know why? Because as we finish, what you notice in these two passages we read is the movement breaks out of the structure, not the other way around. See, when God really starts to move, if you think you can contain it within one church, guys, we got some lessons to learn. And when God moves like this, you notice if you have a non-flexible structure or style or, or our denomination does it like this or we have always preached like this, brother, it will hinder the movement. Sure, sure, as leaders and people, we need some ground level planning for movement and growth. Yes, we need to make sure there's flexible structures. Yes, we need leadership staff that are adaptable to all the different groups of people we're going to come and we need to hold those structures loosely. Do you know why? Because we want to be catalysts, not bottlenecks. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Now this is a holistic approach. I want to say this morning, with a quiet, gentle sense, I walk the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit by I, since Jesus came into my life at 19, I've been an evangelical. I've, all, I've been an evangelical. But I grew up in a modern evangelicalism which seemed to split preaching from social action. And actually, I've come to realize that's not biblically good. I go so far as to say it's actually biblically, it's historically odd. If you notice, Paul and Peter were affecting, they, what God was doing was affecting the community around them, listen, for good. Jesus always speaks forth in his culture. And it's Jesus' culture we want. Now listen friends, listen to what I'm for once. Turning from theory to action is tough. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. <laughs> hey, it's taken me 60 odd years to get here. And I noticed about myself a terrible truth. For years and years, I was notorious for talking about serving and helping the poor and 
rather than doing it. But what movement Christianity does, it brings back Jesus-shaped ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. Hopefully, as God breathes on us, we shall see real, lasting, multiplying success. In fact, almost every Christian movement that is following the Holy Spirit's lead in this is showing a developing concern for biblical ministry and for impacting its community. We believe this is the shape that Jesus wants and it's proven effectively through history that where there is movement, there's always reproduction and there's always multiplication. There's always worship, witness and preaching and there's always healing of the community. Those of us who can remember 1904, <laughs> where I grew up, notice the accent has got picked down now. They call it revival. Yeah, the Welsh revival. And actually, if you study all the revivals in history, that's always been the pattern. Jesus renews his church and lets loose a movement so that people come to a living faith in him and listen. Life in the community gets cleaner and better and more holy. Don't we want to see it? Yes. yes. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh, well done, no? Oh, brilliant. Hey, I'm going to come and take walk off my head because I, I forgot to leave it in the sink. <laughs> okay. Anyone who's watching doesn't know anything about Jesus or there's a lot that uh, they want to ask or please get in touch with us. We have these little booklets, but also we are available online to talk, you know, um, any questions you might have, get in touch on Facebook.
Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You are amazing. You are so amazing. Let's just pray together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And we welcome you, Lord, uh, again. And we look forward to welcoming everybody watching next week when it's uh, Palm Sunday and Dawn's going to be speaking to us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you then. And then the week after, we'll be open Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Please let us know if you do want places on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. We are filling up and we need to know numbers. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you very much.